Hello all, I am Dr. Dheeraj Masapu. I am a consultant neuroanesthesiologist. I give anesthesia for brain and spine surgeries. And uh, thank you for White Army for giving this opportunity to present in your uh, channel. And in this particular presentation, I would be talking about the intraoperative neuro monitoring. So this is a type of technology that uh, we are using nowadays in advanced neurosurgeries to protect the brain and spinal cord uh, during the surgery. Presentation. Uh Thanks to Sakharabad Hospital again for providing uh, such good uh, and uh, wonderful equipment so that we can do all the high quality surgeries. Uh. So why we monitor is uh, basically during the brain and spine surgeries there is always a possibility of damage to neural structure. So by monitoring we try to prevent it. See once the damage has happened. Uh, dealing in brain and spine is very tough. So what we need to do is we need to prevent it and anticipate. So that is what monitoring helps us. So we all know that brain uh, has a special function and uh, not every part of brain has a unique function. The parts of the brain which actually do unique functions are called as eloquent parts of the brain. Uh, like motor function, speech function are the most important ones among the eloquent parts of the brain. So what we are interested in is the speech and motor area. So in this particular presentation uh, I will be focusing more on the motor cortex uh, identification and preventing damage to the motor area which is concerned with the movements of your body. Because speech is a different uh, subject I am not going to cover in this presentation. So in the image, what you are seeing is an MRI. And the first one is called as a DTI sequence, diffusion tensor imaging, where you see the green colored lines are the corticospinal tracts. So we do this in the preoperative period for all patients. And also the next image is functional MRI. By looking at these two, we understand the proximity of the brain tumor to the uh, motor cortex. So if a patient's brain tumor is near the motor cortex, then we uh, enroll the patient for motor cortex stimulation and motor cortex mapping. So what is motor cortex mapping? So motor cortex mapping is just like in a world map, you map different countries. In the same way, on the surface of brain, you have to map the motor area. So how do you identify that? Because to human eye, everything looks similar. You need to identify that by the technology. And technology is what I will be showing you. The different types of uh, uh, mappings that we use to identify the motor area. One is called a central sulcus mapping. And the second one is called as a direct cortical stimulation. So central sulcus mapping is uh, done by uh, electrode which is placed on the surface of the brain. And this particular electrode uh, gives you a signal which you can see on the screen. I will show you. So this particular electrode records the signals from the brain and you are seeing a waves here. So central sulcus mapping is nothing but a somatosensory evapotential wave. I don't want to go into details of each wave. So this particular wave you see a phase reversal. So here, till here there is one phase. The waves are in one form. Here there is a phase reversal. So we alert the surgeon that this is where your central sulcus is going and this is where your uh, motor cortex is located because uh, motor cortex is located in front of the central sulcus. So what you are seeing in the image is the electrode that we use and uh, we stimulate directly on the surface of the brain once we identify the area by central sulcus mapping and uh, the stimulator that we use is called as Ogeman's stimulator. So these are the electrophysiological parameters you can pause and go through if you are an electrophysiologist otherwise you don't have to uh, know so much of details, but I'm going to give all those uh, links in the description. So, so whatever I explained till now, the stimulation on the surface of the brain, you can understand bri uh, briefly if you see this particular video. Yeah. yeah. And there is. So what you have seen in that particular video is we try to stimulate at different areas of the brain and then we get a signal 
uh, called as uh, CMAP or compound motor action potential response on the screen. So where we get the response is the area producing the signal that is the motor cortex. For example, you are getting on the hand area, then it is uh, uh, the area of the brain which is concerned with the hand function. So we try to stay away from that part of the uh, brain cortex. And in this image uh, you are seeing, uh, uh, so, so that is the motor mapping is mainly for the surface tumors. For the tumors which are located deep, we need to do something called as a subcortical mapping. So here what we do is, we use a different type of a stimulator called as a suction stimulator where the suction is connected, the suction that the surgeons use is connected to a electric uh, wire and that is connected to the neuromonitoring machine that we use and constantly will be delivering a current of around 7 to 8 milliampere during the surgery. If the surgeon is near the corticospinal tract, we get a signal. We alert the surgeon that you are close to the tract and he will change the direction. So here you can see. So that is how the suction is connected by a wire and uh, usually what happens is we operate up to a current of around 3 to 5 milliamperes below which we don't go. If we are getting signals at 3 milliamperes then we will halt the surgery there. It is unsafe to continue beyond that which might lead to permanent deficits. Not only the motor and subcortical mapping, we also do a lot of vascular surgeries and uh, carotid endotrectomy is one of them. Many centers do carotid endotrectomy but uh, we are different by monitoring. So what we do is during the temporary clamp application there is a period of time where brain is devoid of blood supply, at least a hemisphere is devoid of blood supply. So during that time, the different ways of monitoring, like NIRS monitoring and some centers do EEG monitoring. And I have used all those things, but what I feel is SSCP monitoring is the most sensitive and specific. And uh, you can uh, tell, uh, interpret the details with more uh, uh, confidence with SSCP monitoring. You can see in this, this is the carotid endotrectomy after the temporary clamp application and uh, I am uh, uh, on the anesthesia side and is running the uh, propofol for this patient. And BP, pulse and all the data is very stable during the surgery. So during the surgery we are monitoring the SSCP. So till the SSCP is intact, that part of the brain is not going to get affected. So if uh, SSCP is dampening more than 50 percent then we will alert the surgeon that uh, that part of the brain is going into ischemia. Then the temporary, we will try to put a uh, shunt uh, across the uh, vessel to uh, provide uh, some kind of blood supply. Epilepsy surgeries also are being uh, done nowadays with uh, uh, LA neuro monitoring. So here what happens is we need to identify the epileptic foci. For that we use uh, something called as electrocorticography. And uh, on in the image what you are seeing is called as a grid electrode which is placed on the surface of the brain. We also have depth electrodes which go inside and uh, try to identify the areas which are generating the epileptic uh, signals. Those are called as foci. Once we identify, only after that we start the resection because we need to remove the part of the brain which is exactly pro producing the epileptic signals. You can see there, the, and uh, the spikes are, those are the epileptic spikes. So, so we will allow you to see the surgeon that those are the part of the You can see the uh, 7, 8, 8, 8, 8, we will tell the surgeon between number 7 and 8 something I was telling in that particular thing. So in those areas epileptic spikes are common and after that we will place a depth electrode in that area and then check uh, whether uh, deeper areas are also involved in generating the signal. After that the resection starts. That is how the epileptic surgery goes on. And it is not so simple as I told. It is more complex. A neurologist and epileptologist are also involved in this. I am trying to oversimplify the stuff for your easier understanding. And in spine surgery, mainly during the intramedullary tumor resections. So scoliosis correction uh, is a standard case. Without neuromonitoring, you are not supposed to operate scoliosis. 
it legally it will be bound to problems if you are doing without uh, neural monitoring and uh, now in our center we do a lot of spine surgeries so we do something called as a pedicle screw monitoring uh, when uh, surgeon spine surgeon is applying a screw uh, by using neural monitoring signals we will tell them whether it's a good screw or bad screw good screw is the one which is away from the neural tracts bad screw is the one which is very close to the nerve root so or a medial it's called a medial breach so the spinal canal can get affected so there is there is also done in a uh, way called as a triggered emg where what happens is when if uh, it is generating an emg activity for a current less than 5 to 7 milliampere that means there is some amount of medial breach or the screw is very close to the neural foramen and even the device is like this called as a jamshedi needle to create a tract before inserting the screw even this device is connected to a neural monitoring machine so while inserting the jamshedi needle also we get signals and during lumbar fusion surgeries also we monitor and uh, very commonly for minimal invasive uh, lumbar fusion surgeries we do the neural monitoring so this is how it looks like uh, please stimulate Please stimulate it seven milliampere. Seven milliampere. Yeah. Yeah. Just leave it. Four is not coming. Just five. It's not coming. No. So that's how we do for minimal invasive surgeries, where uh, navigation guided uh, uh, screw placement is done. So at every stage, we check with uh, electrophysiological pedicle screw. There is a ball tip probe available, which is inserted through the tract. And usually, I take a cutoff of seven milliamperes. Less than that, if I'm getting a signal, I will tell that the tract is very close to the uh, nerve root or in a medial breach is possible. So then they will they will uh, remove the needle and redirect the uh, tract. So that is. Uh, and spinal cord tumor intramedullary tumor resections are done nowadays and during the intramedullary tumor resection we do a different type of monitoring called as a d wave monitoring or epidural monitoring where a catheter with electrodes are inserted into the epidural space you can see like this in a catheter So after inserting the epidural catheter, we get uh, signals from that, and that is called as a D wave. And this is very sensitive and specific for intramedullary tumors. Only in intramedullary tumors we will be doing this wave. So we don't rely on MEPs in intramedullary tumors. Even if MEP decreases, there are uh, many instances where we continue the surgery. Only if D wave is decreasing, we will uh, assume that the motor tracts are getting affected, and we will halt the surgery. This is a uh, typical case of intramedullary tumor i would just like to show you a 30 year old male came to us with the intramedullary tumor and we monitored mep ssp and d wave mep baseline is intact ssp is intact and baseline D-wave. during the surgery meps have dropped but we continued the surgery with uh, d wave monitoring and uh, this is a good d wave monitoring throughout the surgery and post procedure patient had a very mild transient weakness which he uh, after and he was fine after that we even monitor uh, children um, in um, surgeries like meningocele meningomyelocele and tethered cord we use uh, something called as triggered emg or sphincter monitoring uh, so during the surgery and also to identify the neural uh, structures during tethered cord release we will try to identify the phylum and then uh, the neural structures are separated after that the phylum is cut this is how it will look like and this is a new technology that uh, we are getting nowadays and this is called as a brain lab where the blue colored thing is a tumor the face straight so what happens is uh, we can see the uh, proximity of the tumor to the corticospinal tract so during the surgery the brain lab will uh, guide us 
and uh, give us tell us direction proximity to the cortical corticospinal tract and what are pathways will be known during the surgery so that we can adjust the direction and the depth based on that so the standard anesthesia plan is total intravenous anesthesia so the and uh, bis guidance is used so this this is uh, this is a separate topic to discuss it says to identify the depth of anesthesia so if you want to learn all these things i have a observership program in my hospital it's a one month duration and uh, electrophysiologists and anesthesiologists neurosurgeons spine surgeons are eligible for this program so I, if you are really interested you can uh, my contact and email details are there in the description of this youtube video I also have a neuro anesthesia neuro intensive care fellowship program in my hospital it's a one year program and uh, with stipend if you are interested you can apply for this program course starts in the january thank you very much